Welcome to this online lesson looking at helping the wounded. This is the second in a three-part series. First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, Voluntary Aid Detachments and the RAMC. The aims of this lesson are to gather information on the evacuation route and nursing, to know and recall knowledge of the evacuation route and nursing, and to ass assess the success of the evacuation route. You'll notice that I've used the term evacuation route several times there. If you've not yet done part one on the evacuation route, I strongly urge you to look at this first, unless you've got good existing knowledge of it. Here's a do now task to get you going. Think about what else you've learned on the medicine through time topic. If you've not yet looked at my lessons on Florence Nightingale, for example, this would be a good opportunity to do that as well. So how had Florence Nightingale improved the status and effectiveness of nursing in the 19th century? And what new challenges might World War I present to nurses? If possible, give specific details of the challenges and wounds World War I nurses would face. I've got a lesson on that as well. OK, pause the video here while you attempt those tasks. Done? OK, so how had Florence Nightingale improved the status and effectiveness of nursing? Well, in the early 19th century, nurses were very much considered as a lowly profession. Not professional at all. In fact, they were very, very much looked down on, seen as being quite slovenly. Florence Nightingale transformed that. She demonstrated the importance of skilled nursing during the Crimean War, and she established a training hospital at St Thomas's Hospital in London. Ever since, nurses have been seen as highly professional, and they have been very respected members of society. That was very much the case in World War I as well. But what new challenges might World War I present to nurses? A lot of this is down to the scale of the conflict, the sheer number of wounded who would need to be treated, and the fact that so many nurses would, for the first time, be required to be so near to the front lines of the fighting. Close enough, in fact, to be in harm's way themselves. So hopefully we could give some specific details of the challenges and wounds that they would face. Gunshot wounds are probably the most obvious ones, referred to in army parlance as GSWs. Shrapnel wounds gave some absolutely horrific effects as well. And don't forget things like gas. This was a time of new technology, and so the wounds were only going to get more numerous and also more deadly. As long as you've got the uh, requisite existing knowledge to carry on, let's move forward. If not, I do urge you to have a look at those earlier lessons that I mentioned. So how well did the evacuation route work? Despite the word evacuation, the aim of the evacuation route was actually to treat soldiers as near to the front lines as possible and also to return soldiers to the front line as soon as possible. 67% of wounded soldiers returned to the front line after treatment, so the majority. Here's a question then. How far do you agree that the evacuation route was effective? Explain your answer. And then read the information on page 132 of the NXL um, Medicine Free Time textbook. If you haven't got this, then instead I urge you to have a look at your notes uh, that came, came with uh, the, your lesson on the evacuation route from this channel. Write a peel paragraph to explain your answer. And remember, a peel paragraph is make a point, so each paragraph should have a clear focus, give some evidence to back it up, explain the effects of that or the importance of it, and then link it back to the question. In this case, it's linking it back to the evacuation route and its effectiveness. OK, as long as you've got the requisite knowledge for that, have a go at the, that question now. Pause the video while you do so. Now, I expect that many of you will have identified that the evacuation route was actually highly effective and efficient. Given the terrible wounds that people suffered in World War I, it's actually really good how many soldiers they were able to save. Although, of course, terrible how many had to die as well. But to get 67%, the majority of wounded soldiers returned to the front line after treatment, is a brilliant result. And it just shows how important this was for keeping the strength of the army high enough to fight such a long and protracted war as World War I. Of course, what this does ignore is the mental trauma that these wounded men often suffered. And this was not so effectively treated. We're going to have a look now at some of the organisations that were in charge of the basic care of the sick and, of course, the wounded. It should be recognised that there were a lot of people other than just the doctors and surgeons helping out with this. And as a new subheading, the men, the Royal Army Medical Corps. The RAMC were the Army's organisation for medical care, and so that meant the health of the soldiers as well as the wounded. It consisted of everyone from doctors and surgeons to ambulance drivers and orderlies, 
the orderlies being those who did more menial, menial tasks like cleaning and working as stretcher, stretcher bearers. Vital and important, but not quite so highly professional and skilled. The RAMC grew from 9,000 men in 1914 to over 113,000 by 1918. And as we'll see, even that number isn't really enough. But it's an organisation that was large and it really grew across the years. The RAMC eventually allowed doctors aged up to 45 to serve abroad. They had to learn quickly to deal with the new and horrifying wounds of World War I. Here's a task then. Review this information on the slide and produce a 5Ws card on the RAMC. And what I mean by 5Ws is who were they, what did they do, where did they serve, when were they active, and you can also link that to the number of people who served with them, and why were they needed. If you do that quickly, then here's an extension question. Study the RAMC badge at the top right here. The motto means faithful in adversity or difficulty. Why do you think this was chosen? Also, if you are quite familiar with the Medicine Through Time topic as a whole, you hopefully recognise the symbol in the middle of it. What is the symbol on the badge? What does it represent? Or at least, what did it represent? OK, plenty to get on with there, so pause the video and complete those answers. Done? Well, let's check that you got everything that you need. So who were the Royal Army Medical Corps? It's the Army's organisation in charge of medical care, both health and wounds. What did they do? Virtually everything related to that topic. So doctors, ambulance drivers, orderlies, stretcher bearers, you name it. Where did they serve? Well, as we can see with the fact about the doctors aged over 45, they served abroad and in every theatre of war. When were they active? Throughout the war. And you can see how they grew. It would be a good idea to add that there were 9,000 um, people with the RAMC in 1914 and 113,000 by 1918 to show this rapid growth. And why were they needed? Well, because of the scale of World War I, there was going to be a lot of wounded men who needed help. We can see an example of the early work of the RAMC in that, uh, that painting at the bottom there. We can tell this is early in the war because they're not yet issued with the steel helmets and the trenches are only temporary. So this is likely representing the situation in 1914. What about the extension questions, though? The motto means faithful in adversity and difficulty. I think that's quite apt, really. It shows that the men had a certain confidence in the RAMC to help them even in extraordinary and difficult, and let's face it, dangerous circumstances. The symbol in the middle is the staff of Asclepius. Asclepius was the ancient Greek god of medicine and healing. The ancient Greeks could go to a temple called an Asclepion, where they believed that Asclepius would come down and heal them. Asclepius was thought to carry a staff which represented his authority, but also coiled around it was a serpent or snake which would coil off and often take part in some of these treatments. Ever since ancient Greek times, it's been a recognised symbol of healing, right the way from the ancient Greek times through to the Romans and even in more modern times. In fact, today you'll often see this symbol on ambulances right, away, right around the world. So that's covered the men who, let's face it, had the biggest organisation, but there were a significant number of women who helped out as well. These were known as fannies, stop laughing at the back, vads and QAs. But what on earth does that stand for? In the nursing services, the line between civilian and military was rather blurred. Nurses were often civilians, but they worked under the orders, direction, and to a certain extent, the discipline of the army. The first organisation, and one of the more important ones, was Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. This was attached to the army. This was a professional and well-trained unit. They provided hospital and field nurses near to the front line. There were 700 members of Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service in 1914, but that had increased to 23,000 by 1918. The painting at the top shows a typical uniformed member of Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. She's even wearing a medal, this would have been for good conduct and long service. And it is a good sign of how attached they were to the army. And we can even see some uh, badges of rank, those pips on the shoulder, representing a, an almost military style of, uh, of leadership. So the most professional, highly trained nurses uh, and most disciplined ones were in the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. But even 23,000 nurses by 1918 is nowhere near enough to cope with demand. That brings in the Voluntary Aid Detachments, or VADs. These were volunteer nurses who supported the army nurses in Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. 
5,300 volunteered in 1914, and there were 38,000 who served in total throughout the war. However, the voluntary aid detachment women had to be self-sufficient. They didn't get necessarily paid for their work, and they, if they were leaving a family behind, they needed to be able to uh, support themselves as well. So poorer women who tended to do jobs of their own back in England didn't tend to join the VADs. So they had to be financially sufficient, and so they tended to be women from better off families. They often tended to be young and single too, so that they didn't have, say, a husband or children that they had to look after. If that sounds a bit sexist, remember that I am talking about the context of 1914 to 1918 here, which was a much more sexist society than we have today. They started by simply doing menial jobs like scrubbing floors and cleaning, but eventually, as demand and experience increased, they took on more nursing jobs too. The voluntary aid detachments couldn't help but learn a lot from the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service, who were often in charge of them. The last one, and probably the most unusual one, was the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, otherwise known as the Fannies. Founded with the mad idea of bringing back the wounded on horseback, actually these were mostly upper-class women. Naturally, the horse riding never happened, and instead they drove ambulances and trucks and even a mobile bath lorry. However, let's not exaggerate how many of them there were. Only 116 were actually working in France in 1918, with others employed in England. These were upper-class women who had great high ideals of helping the wounded off the battlefield, and this they did, but there were never that many of them. Let's consolidate some notes and knowledge then. Firstly, summarise the role of each group. Include the numbers, of the, the numbers involved, the type of work that they did, and their level of training. Secondly, which groups seem to have been most important in helping? And I do think that there is a right answer to this, so give it some real thought. Then explain why. As an extension, which group gave women the most chance to prove themselves to doubtful men? Explain your choice. Earlier, when referring to the voluntary aid detachments, I mentioned the sexism of the time. Remember this is the same period in which the suffragettes were campaigning for women to get the vote. And the sexist patriarchal society of the time decided that these women were often too soft to do, the, to do these jobs. Obviously, the First World War proved how ridiculous an idea that was. These women served bravely, and indeed, some of them died in service. They are buried at the casualty clearing stations alongside the soldiers that they were there to treat. Anyway, I digress slightly, so pause the video here, complete those tasks, and then we'll review the answers. Done? So hopefully you've got necessary detail down for each of these three different groups. So which group seem to have been most important in helping? If you've chosen the first aid nursing yeomanry, I'm afraid you can't really support that position. There were so few of them that they weren't a significant contribution. Interesting, but not as important. For the other two, there's possibly an argument to be made for both of them. The voluntary aid detachments certainly helped the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service and the Royal Army Medical Corps do their job. It would have been incredibly difficult to keep up with demand without the help of the voluntary aid detachments. However, Probably the most appropriate answer is the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. After all, they were the core of the professional nursing service that were helping the majority of soldiers in World War I and assisting the Royal Army Medical Corps. Without them, the voluntary aid detachments would also not have been able to uh, get the expertise they eventually got. So it can be seen that the voluntary aid detachments assisted Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service who, I suppose in turn, relied on the voluntary aid detachments to do their work effectively. So this has been a fairly brief lesson, but we're going to try and put it to the test now. Study this poster. What can it tell us about the role of the voluntary aid detachments in helping the wounded? Pause the video now and try and attempt to answer that question. Look closely at the poster to help you. Perhaps you noticed at the top of the poster, behind the women, there's a list of different places. France, Italy, Malta, Egypt, Mesopotamia and various other places. This represents the worldwide duties in all of the theatres of war that the voluntary aid detachments took part in. Perhaps more obviously though, we can see at the bottom lists of what they actually did. There were nursing members who would have directly helped with the treatment of men. But also the cooks, kitchen maids, clerks, housemaids, ward maids, laundresses, motor drivers, etc. who would have kept all of that going. And they are urgently needed at the bottom there. Sure, this source has the purpose of trying to encourage people to join, so they're bound to say that. But the scale of the casualties in World War I show that this really was the case. So they had an urgent role in supporting the medical services in every theatre of the war. 
try and include all of those points within your answer. You can pause the video here if you want to make those improvements. If not, we'll move on. Secondly then, in your opinion, which group was most significant? The Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service, the VADs, Fanny, or the RAMC? Explain your opinion with specific examples and statistics. You might be thinking you've just done this task, but no, you haven't. The RAMC wasn't there before. So, do you think the RAMC was more important than your previous choice, or not? Explain your answer. Pause the video while you do that. Done? Okay. Well, again, although this is a matter of opinion, and so often in history, as long as you can support it, that's fine, here I do think there is a right answer. And this is a bit that's possibly going to get me in trouble, isn't it? I in no way want to lessen the contribution of all of these women's groups to the First World War and to medical care. They were remarkable, they were brave, they worked tirelessly, and they were complete trailblazers in their, uh, in their field. But we have to look at one thing in particular. Even by the end of the war, there were 23,000 members of Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. Very significant. But that is less than a quarter of the 113,000 who were serving in the Royal Army Medical Corps at that time. And so still, the majority of the heavy lifting, if you will, of the medical services in World War I were being performed by the Royal Army Medical Corps. So the correct answer to question two, really, is that the Royal Army Medical Corps remained the most important part of the medical services in World War I. The VADs, Fanny, and, and the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service worked tirelessly to support the Royal Army Medical Corps. But without the Royal Army Medical Corps, they simply wouldn't have been enough to help. So thank goodness, all of them contributed. But Royal Army Medical Corps were the majority of the workers. On that note, that's the end of the lesson. It's only been a short one, but hopefully it's given you a basic introduction to these different groups. I hope it's been useful to you. If it has, then by all means, uh, like this video and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and by the way, if you strongly disagree with my view on question two there, and you think that one of the other groups is, has got a better claim to be the most important, why not put your answer in the comments? I'd love to see it, and maybe you'll change your mind. But maybe you won't. That's the joy of history. We're allowed to disagree. Thanks very much for watching, and goodbye.